Well, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Let me just say what an honor it is to be in this pulpit. Uh, a few years ago, I would not have been in this pulpit. <laughs> and maybe I was the guy your pastor warned you about. Uh, but I'm thankful to be here this evening. I'm thankful for the long suffering of the Lord, his patience. And I'm thankful to be here with my abolition brothers and sisters this evening. And let me say before I start, you can't be pro-life and abolition at the same time. It's like, yeah, it's like embracing semi-Pelagianism and calling yourself a Calvinist. Uh, it just doesn't work. My prayer is if that was your attitude or if that is your attitude coming in here this evening, is that you will go ahead and repent of pro-lifeism tonight as I have and fully embrace abolition. Thank you, Brett, for letting me be here. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm thankful for all of you. I will have to say that I got here as early as I could today to be with you, but as soon as I'm done, I'll have to leave. Uh, I've got other engagements tomorrow, so I won't be able to stay with you to watch the documentary, but I will watch the documentary. Our text tonight is Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, I want to start by reading to you um, a, a paragraph from Frederick Butcher. Please listen carefully. There were banks of candles flickering in the distance and clouds of incense thickening the air with holiness, stinging his eyes and high above him as if it had always been there but was only seen for what it was, you know, like a face in the leaves of a tree or a bear among the stars. There was the mystery himself whose gown was the incense and the candles of dusting a fold at the hem. There were winged creatures shouting back and forth the way excited children shout to each other when dust calls them home. And the whole vast reeking palace started to shake beneath his feet like a wagon going over cobbles and he cried out, O oh God, I am done for. I am a foul mouth and the member of a foul mouth raced. When my two eyes I have seen, I am a goner and sunk. Then one of the wings of the creatures touched my mouth with fire and said, there it will be all right now. And the mystery himself said, who will it be? And with charred lips he said, me. And mystery said, Go. Mystery went on to say, give to the death hell till you're blue in the face and go show the blind heaven till you drop in your tracks because they'd sooner eat ground glass than swallow the bitter, the bitter pill that puts roses in their cheeks and a gleam in the eye. Go do it. Do it till when? Do it till hell freezes over. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who, who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord 
saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he, go, he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their ears and or eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a timber or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. We look at that word in Isaiah, in the words of Butcher said, do it till when? Butcher records that mystery said, till hell freezes over. Is that not what a prophet does? Isn't that the responsibility of a prophet? To preach and to proclaim the word of God, to say, thus saith the Lord, until when? Until God says you're done. And so Isaiah did. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, Uzziah's reign was long and prosperous. God lavished success on his people, but they didn't handle it very well. They continued to conform to their traditional faith, but God had, in a sense, had become unreal to them. Can you imagine going through the religious motions without worshiping God? Uzziah sought for God, but when he was, but when he was strong, as Uzziah became strong, uh, proud in his heart to his destruction. Sadly, the whole nation followed their king into complacency, and God's patience with them finally ran out. And Uzziah's death marked the end of that error. The title of my message tonight is The Greatest Need of the American Church. I know the context of the passage. But I believe the principles that we see in this passage apply to the American church today. I believe that the need there was in Isaiah's day is the same need there is in our day. We look at our land and it was much like it was in the days of Uzziah. God had long and had, has caused our people, our land, to be prosperous. God has lavished upon us. God has blessed the American church. We don't see the persecution that many of our brothers and sisters see in, in other parts of the world. We will. We've been blessed. But we have not handled it well. For the most part, we've held on to our traditional faith those of us who are conservative evangelicals. We've held on to the tradition of our faith, but yet there's little worship of God in our land. I just wonder how real is God to most people who call themselves Christians? I can't help but ask myself the question is how real could God be to me if I permit the murder of innocent children and call myself a child of God. Just like Uzziah, we have become proud to our own destruction. We need an end of this error. And thank God for movements like this one. We look in this passage and we realize that even though one king is dead, the king still reigns. Uzziah is dead, but the Lord's on his throne. In this passage of scripture, Isaiah was worshiping in the temple one day and his vision was lifted beyond 
his present surrounding and to the presence of God. He was lifted beyond what could be seen with the physical eye to the heavenly throne room. He saw God. And a word of caution for us, lest we enter into this passage too lightly. A word from John Calvin would serve us well at this moment. He said, or wrote, but we ought to be aware when God exhibited himself to the view of the fathers, he never appeared such as he actually is, but such as the capacity of man could receive. God told us if any man looks upon God, he'll die. Isaiah's not dying. What's happening? I believe that God has given Isaiah a vision of what his capacity could handle in agreement with Calvin. He says that though men may be said to creep on the ground or at least dwell far below the heavens, there is no absurdity in supposing that God comes down to them in such a manner as to cause some kind of mirror to reflect the rays of his glory. Uh, much like Moses. Lord, show me your glory. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to let you see the back. And I'll cause my goodness to pass by. I believe we have such an instance here. I think that's important for us to understand, as you'll see here just in a moment. Therefore, exhibited to Isaiah by God was such a form as enabled him accordingly to behold the capacity to perceive the inconceivable mystery, majesty, as revealed in the person of God. Here is God sitting upon his throne. We catch a glimpse of his attributes. We see his robe. We catch a glimpse of even his bodily appearance. I share with you, and this is the first thing that I believe that the American church needs. I believe that the American church, which includes you and me, is a renewed vision of the holiness of God. Whether in Hebrew, kadosh, 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 or in Greek, hagios, 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 or in Latin, sanctus, 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 or in English, holy, holy, holy. What we have here is a, the seraphic words of praise that calls the people in, of God into the presence of God. The word holy is an inspiring word awe-inspiring. It's the command to respect. It means to be set apart, to be sacred, to be dedicated, to be, to, complete, to be completely consecrated. So if we look at this, we say, man, God is holy, holy, holy. And I know a lot of people like to preach the Trinity from that, but the emphasis is upon the intensity of God's glory, the intensity of God's holiness. If you want to get to the Trinity, we can get there in a moment, just not right there. So here's Isaiah catching this vision, I believe a partial vision, vision of the Lord. And the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Why three times? To impress upon us the intensity of the very holiness of God. We need a renewed vision of the holiness of God. Here is God in his heavenly temple. And there's a couple of things that we see. We see, first of all, we see the sovereignty of God's reign. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. That's not the point of my sermon, but man, look at that. Holy God is sitting upon the throne. He reigns sovereignly over all things. He has supreme reign. Even though Uzziah is dead, don't fret, God's on the throne. Supreme reign, sovereign reign over everything. And he reigns in holiness. But we also see his power to judge. He's not just sovereign Lord who has supreme reign. 
He is the most powerful judge. Look here. I saw the Lord setting upon the throne high and lifted up. And then we see his majestic splendor and the temple. The Bible says the train of his robe. Notice how many times he uses that word filled. The train of his robe filled the temple. Filled, the Bible says. The train of his robe filled the temple. The presence of God is full. It's, it's, it fills the temple. What is that pointing to? The weightiness of God. He is heavy. He is intense. He is sovereign. Majestic. Lord. Who judges righteously. He is transcendent he is high above us he is other than us and one of the things I love about this passage of scripture because as you can tell words escape me I feel like the apostle John in the book of Revelation it was like this it was like that it's John's way of saying I'm doing the best I can to describe you but my words fall short so I'm going to tell you what it's like I feel the same way here. Make no mistake about it. I, I, my words fall short as I try to describe to you the holiness of God. And here's the awesome thing. This is not even the full manifestation of the glory of God or the holiness of God. If Isaiah were to have grabbed hold of the fullness of God's holiness, he would have died immediately. Notice who attend to the Holy One. Of Israel the Bible says seraphim literally that means burning ones burning ones it points to their power and their purity now what do we know about angels except from the third who fell with Satan we know they're sinless they are without sin they are burning ones they are powerful they are Pure, but notice their posture in the text. It will tell you about the holiness of God if you look at their posture towards the one on the throne. The Bible says, above him stood the seraphim, makes you question why are they above the sovereign one? Shouldn't they be below? But there they are above. And there are the burning ones. Each had six wings. Notice, and two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Again, we're talking about the holiness of God here. We're not talking about the angels. We're looking at the posture of the angels to teach us about the holiness of God. Because as an American church, we have lost sight of the holiness of God. You say, well, I haven't. I'm an abolitionist. Do you watch porn? Do you run up your credit card debt? It's easy for us to be sanctimonious and prideful. My point in preaching this moment, sermon is not against pornography or drunkenness or anything like that. My point in preaching this message is to remind us of the holiness of God in all things, especially as it pertains to the murder of innocent children. God is holy. And the holy God of Israel has already spoken on this issue. There's no issue for debate. There's no debate between immediatism or incrementalism when God has already spoken. The issue is not clarity on the topic. The issue is the holiness of God. And whether or not you bow before the holiness of God. Because when God has already spoken on an issue like he has in the Bible, if you do not stop immediately child sacrifice, I'm going to pour out my wrath upon you. That's pretty clear. So what's the issue? 
It's the holiness of God. And we're not talking about a lost world. We're talking about the church. How holy is God? Notice what the sinless angels do. They cover their face. I believe, and you can debate this if you will, it's no bother to me. I believe that God is giving Isaiah a glimpse of the glory in agreement with Calvin. I know I do not carry the weight that he does, so I use him. So we have a glimpse of the glory, and if that is true, the angels who are sinless cannot even bear to behold the mirror of the glory of God. Sinless, pure angels, when they behold the throne room of God, when they behold the glory of God, what do they do? They cover their face in a sign of humility. Notice their posture, a posture of humility. They covered their feet, the Bible says. Reverence. Fear. In the presence of God, realizing that He is holy. And they covered their feet in a sign of reverence before the Holy One of Israel. This majestic, glorious, weighty, Holy God. Sinless angels cover their face. They cover their feet. And they cry out. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is, is filled with the glory of God. And with two they flew. That's why they were above the Holy One of Israel. You know why? We're here to do your bidding, Lord. You just say the word and we go. What is your will? Where will you send us, O God? Tell us. We will go. We're here to do your bidding. Ready to go. I ask you, beloved, is this not the proper posture before the Holy the Holy? The true holy God? Is this not the proper posture? Is it not one of humility and reverence and obedience? Therefore, if we, not, if we are not humble, if we are not reverent, if we are not obedient, then what does that say about our perspective of the holiness of God? Not only do we need a renewed vision of the holiness of God, we need a renewed vision of the sinfulness of sin. It was the Puritans who prayed, grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding beauty of holiness. And they also prayed, grant me to never lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The Bible says there, after they cried out, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the, 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 the Lord of war, the Lord of the angels' armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then notice what happened. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. That's the very glory of God. And I said, And we see the awe and we see the terror of Isaiah. It's a holy terror. Make no mistake about it. He is not afraid of God as much as he is in fear of God. But when he beheld that vision, his own sinfulness was, was exacerbated in himself. This is not Isaiah's salvation. He's already saved. This is Isaiah's commissioning. We have a prophet of God who says, 
as he becomes awfully aware of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin, what is his response? Woe is me. It's a knock. Woe is me. You know, the Net Bible says, destroyed. The New Living says doomed. The NIV, whether you like it or not, says ruined. The reason that Isaiah gives such a distress is because he sees his filthiness before a holy God. Shall I say this? I know my audience tonight, and I wish my audience were a lot of my friend pastors who are unwilling to, for whatever reason, to embrace abolitionism. I wish, in a way, that this was a group of pro-life pastors. And I would say to you, in light of what you hear, how in the world could you maintain your current position in light of the holiness of God? How could you continue to hold your position in light of the sinfulness of sin? Isaiah says, I can't even open my mouth to praise God. I hear the angels praising, but I can't praise. Do you ever wonder why he said, for I'm unclean, I dwell amongst the people, or my, I'm a man of unclean lips? Why did he confess his sin that way? There's many other ways. He could have said an unclean heart. He said of unclean mind. I mean, an unclean, uh, that would have been closer to the equivalent of the, the, the body, mind, and soul in the Hebrew context. But he didn't. He said, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. Why would he say lips? Because what's he hearing? He's hearing the lips of the sinful, sinless angels sing praises to Yahweh. He is hearing them with their lips saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the whole earth is, is, is full of His glory. And He says, I can't speak it. My lips are filthy. They're unclean. Oh, that every American church would have such a view of child sacrifice. We need a renewed vision of the sinfulness of sin. The great evil of our day, I believe, and I think you do too, is the murder of innocent children in their mother's womb. But yet, it's glibly talked about, I'm talking about pastors, or who feel like they've done their duty when they've attended a rose day, which most don't. Don't even do that. I will never attend another one. The last one we had, when the ice storm, guess who was scheduled to speak? You're looking at him. Me and Abby Johnson, we were out up there together. But listen, oh, how things have changed. But I tell you, many do not even do that. Can I tell you from experience that many do not even, I know we don't agree with those things, but just hear me out. Many don't even preach a sanctity of human life sermon once a year. They don't even do that. We say, well, Pastor, we don't believe in those things. I get it. But those who will be the first to stand up and say, well, they won't even say that, that abortion is murder. I can only come to one conclusion, unless I be careful or I become prideful. 
is you have lost sight of the holiness of God. And you have lost sight of the utter sinfulness of sin. Oh, how we need a renewed vision. Listen, lastly, we need a renewed vision of the precious blood of Christ. And if you can't see Christ in this passage, I don't know what to say to you. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the true King, the Lord of hosts. Here it is. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your mouth. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is its own for. God met Isaiah in his greatest point of need, which was atonement. Kippur is the word. Sins. Your guilt is departed, he says, or your guilt is taking away. Kippur, atonement. Your sin has been atoned for. And what better place to demonstrate the, his atonement than in his lips? He's a prophet. He has a responsibility to do one thing, and that is to proclaim the word of God. But yet he can't even praise God, much less proclaim the word of God. So what does the Lord do? He meets him in his greatest need and he sends the seraphim to touch his lips with the burning coal. The Bible says, knowing that you were not ransomed from your forefathers with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. I look in this passage and I see Christ. And I see what Christ went through me. Why burning coals? Why such a graphic picture of burning coals touching a lip? Have you ever tried to think about that in your mind and what that would look like? But that's the graphic picture that we have here. Does it not point us to the cross and what Christ endured on our behalf? Christ, the sinless Son of God, who left the glories of heaven clothed in human flesh, who went to the cross, bearing the penalty of our sin and suffering the full brunt of God's righteous indignation, God's wrath, and then finishing it and turning the cup over and saying, it is finished. Christ died for me. Christ died for you. He died for us in our depravity, which was total. He died for us in our sin, when we were enemies of God, when we were dead in our trespasses, which when, when we were in ungodly rebellion. But yes, Christ came and he bought us. He bought us with a price. And what was that price? As Peter said, the precious blood of the lamb. Christ has paid the way. Christ has atoned for our sin. Have we forgotten what Christ endured? Have we forgotten that we are not our own, but we have been bought? Therefore, our lives are no longer our own, and we are to consider them precious not unto ourselves. But we are instruments of holy God who have been forgiven of the sinfulness of sin. There's only one response. There's only one response. I've heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Do you not see God in the divine counsel here? Us. There's your Trinity, beloved. God there in the divine counsel, who shall go for us? I'll take a punch at something just for a moment. Send. The, the Septuagint translates that apostello or the apostle. Are we not all apostles? 
Have we not all been sent? Hear my Lord, send me. He's more enthusiastic in this confession than he was the first. The first confession was, woe is me. The second confession is, send me. That's what the blood atonement does. Sadly, the message that he is given by God is a message of judgment. But the good news is, listen, is that God would ultimately restore his people and later the world itself, just as he had restored Isaiah. I don't know if you've noticed it or not. Do you notice that Isaiah's posture mirrors that of the angels? Humility, the angels covered their face. Reverence, they covered their feet. Obedience, they flew. Same thing with Isaiah. This, this is the response to the holiness of God. Woe is me, humility. My eyes have seen the Lord. Reverence, here am I, send me. Obedience. I ask you abolitionists tonight, for those of you who are weary and tired, or those of you who may be joining, what does God demand of us in light of the holiness of God, the sinfulness of sin, in light of the precious blood of Christ? What does he demand of us? Here am I, Lord, send me. But do it till when? Till hell freezes over or abortion is abolished. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for the clarity of scripture. And I thank you for the fact that your word never returns void. Lord, I understand, or at least I think I do, the weight and the responsibility that you have placed upon myself in preaching this message, but also the weight and the responsibility that you've placed on us all by hearing this message. Lord, help us to be faithful. And we pray that not only do you add to our number those who are being saved, we pray that you add to our number those who are hell-bent on abolishing abortion. In Jesus' name, amen.